This is the Fame Factor on 4. It's the summer holidays and there's a new flowering of music fans. These girls have travelled from all over Britain to stand at the gates of Wembley Arena hoping to catch a glimpse of their favourite rock stars. Shirley Watts is one of the few women who have realised the ultimate teenage fantasy of marrying a rock star. For 32 years, her husband Charlie has been playing drums for the most consistently successful rock band of all time. show that he did with Alexis Corner. He started off this new blues band and I saw him. I fell in love with him. We went out together for about six months and then I went off to my new life at the Royal College. My future didn't really hold any place in it for Charlie. And he went off and did something else and we joined the Rolling Stones. And then we met again um, a year later and then there was no looking back for us. The rest of the band didn't think it was such a good idea. Because they, in those days, fans had to feel that each member of the group was available. And mine wasn't. I was told not to wear a ring when I was with him. And I had to walk uh, several paces behind. When it started, he didn't want to get involved with anyone. He didn't want a relationship. So he'd said this, you know, he'd said, I don't want to get involved. And of course, I took that as a challenge, as one does. <laughs> Thought, well, you are going to be involved, you know. You're going to fall in love with me. And he did. I took shelter from a shower. And I stepped in. The funny thing about actually going to bed with Shane for the first time, what we used to do was just sit up all night and drink and talk, you know, all night. And we did this for quite a while before we actually ever got around to getting near the bed. And, it was, and Shane was very shy and so was I, so he would sit like where you're sitting and I'd sit where I'm sitting and we'd talk and we'd never actually get very close physically. And so one night I think he asked me if he could sit next to me and I said yeah okay. <laughs> and so he sat next to me 
and we ended up kissing each other and it ended up sort of on the bed and then him, when he actually took his clothes off he had a pair of red nylon wife fronts that he'd probably been wearing for about six months <laughs> When David Bowie met his future wife Angie, he was an emerging singer-songwriter, she was an aspiring actress. It was fun. We went out to dinner and then we went to the speakeasy. Thank God I could dance, because David said, oh, can you dance? I said, certainly. Come on. So we did that, you know, and it was, it was, it was okay. It was sort of, um, I think I, we got along very well. You know, I mean, it was a nightclub. It wasn't like I could, you know, have a conversation about the material or how it was going to be arranged, and I didn't know anyway. I mean, it was a kid. I was... 18. But I noticed that everyone at the speakeasy, all the people in the music business, got up. They stood up and said hello to him. They didn't just sit there. And I thought, hmm, hmm, I wonder why. Angie and David married in 1970. She got a work permit, he got an art director. Before we got married, he told me, he said, I'm not in love with you. I said, well, I don't think I'm in love with you. I said, I, I probably am, but I know I'm kidding myself. You know, a and I could, ha I could handle that. The pact that we made was that we would work on his career first and then we would work on mine. And, and then that way, you know, we'd both contribute to each other's success. Angie helped David transform himself from a struggling folk singer into a glamorous rock star. We went to Mr. Fish, and we were upstairs looking around, and there was all kinds of fabulous things. They were all very expensive. So then I said to Michael Fish, I said, now, Michael, I said, this is all very well, but it's a bit straight and it's a bit overpriced. So what have you got hidden? Where are all the samples? Where's all the stuff that you're not quite sure if it worked? And a bell went off. His eyes lit up. He went, oh, I've got just the thing. And he brought those dresses up. And David was in them in a flash, because, I mean, they were gorgeous. I mean, they weren't dresses at all. You know, they were big, medieval robes, but modern. And it made him look fabulous. He had this long, fucking curly hair. He looked like a girl. So, I mean, it was like, whoa, yeah, baby, they'll notice you. Ozzy Osbourne never had any trouble getting noticed. One of the original wild men of heavy metal, he's legendary for his drug and alcohol intake and for biting the heads off bats. Ozzy's career is masterminded and run by his wife from their family home in Gerrard's Cross. Mom, this year Patricia made lovely. It's chicken soup. Just have a, have a card up there. The show, he's, he goes on about 9.15, so you'll be there a good two hours before. When Sharon met Ozzy, she was a secretary. When she married him, she became his manager. All his entire career, he'd had bad management, never paid taxes, the managers took all the money, he had bad deals at record companies. His whole life went from one bad scenario to another. He, there was never any good times, except that he was selling records and he had a huge fan base, but yet he, he never reaped the rewards. So, you know, like, how's your husband? Is he, uh, is he straight? Is he, you know, is he coherent? Meanwhile, you know, you, you went into office and there was a mound of cocaine and he was sweating up a storm and white foam was coming out the corners of his mouth. And uh, he'd say to me, well, fuck off, go lose weight and have a baby. Fuck off out my office. To have an artist that was successful and, and is there with a young woman it was like you just didn't do it in those days it just they didn't want to deal with me at all but you persevered Pers persevered and he's gone and i'm still there my first child i worked up to the afternoon that she was born i was i was working i had i had no option how is it to bring a small child on tour how did it it's not a great, you know, it sounds a romantic thing and it's like, you know, like the, you know, being in a, in a circus and you're born into that lifestyle, but it's not, it's not a great thing. It was one ear infection after another and, 
you know, it was colds and tummy upsets and you're on the road and you can't, you know, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. It was a nightmare. Did you do tours? Yes, I did. Yes, I did the early ones. But I think I would have been better off staying at college. Because there was no place for a wife on the tours, you know. There was nothing to do and uh, nobody wanted you around. Oh, I sat in these dingy hotel rooms and I sketched and I read and wished I was somewhere else. I just wanted to be with Charlie so badly. Even when, like Jean-Michel Jarre, a rock star marries an internationally famous actress, she may not find it easy to cope with the demands of his fame. We were very much together in all the, the, the very big concerts that Jean-Michel started to do. I was right there beside him, we were organising him, it was really done in an almost sort of, you know, market garden way. It was completely, uh, complete improvisation. It was very pioneering, we went to China, we went to, to America, and, and then it became more of an industry, and then I felt, um, then I felt very lost, I somehow didn't have my place anymore. And there's nothing you can do about it because that's the progress, that's the way, you know, the sort of, it's like a great roller coaster that starts to, you know, starts to gather speed and you can't stop it once it's on the rails. And you wouldn't want to stop it because you know that, you know, I mean, that's not the point. He needs a whole infrastructure around him, so there are people constantly around him and those sort of people are in adoration and in worship to the idol. So where does somebody else sort of come in and sort of say, hi, you know, I'm, I'm here, and sort of smile when you walk into a room and there are sort of eight people there constantly. You know, you still, in the end, you say, fuck this for a laugh, you know, and turn out and walk out. You know, because you know that there is no place, although you know there is a place, you have the place in the man's heart. That's unquestionable for me, it's unquestionable. That was never in question or in doubt. But the reality was something, something different. I've often wondered if, in fact, I, I felt a certain amount of jealousy because of the attention that he's received, and I, I think I have to confess that, yes, I have. In the, but in the end, in the end, it, it's, all up to, it's all up to you, isn't it? What you do with what you've got in life. What did you aspire to? Well, I thought I'd be a great sculptor. I still shall. You can see it from this side. Shirley was asked to leave the Royal College of Art when she married Charlie, but her old tutor has always kept an interest in her it's work. An amazing cast. It is. But he just looks really the, good. Um, aluminium. Very, very lively. So elegant, graceful. Is this a big head? That's going to be the head. It's minus the muzzle and the ears and the rest of its shoulder. And it's quite difficult because the horse that it represents is, is up at the other stable, so I have to keep nipping up there to have a bit of it. It's an excellent start, Shirley. It's quite, got quite a long way to go. <laughs> In the quest for that elusive rock and roll husband, some rock and roll girls have to try and try and try again. I could have met people a couple of times in very odd situations when I was young, like walking down the street one time, Jimi Hendrix tried to pick up my girlfriend and I and take us to a concert, and I ran away in horror because I thought it was a pimp. <laughs> I thought a pimp had driven up and was trying to pick us up. <laughs> and my girlfriend, she takes me to the music store to show me how stupid I was, and she holds up a copy of Are You Experienced? And she goes, do you see whose car you didn't get into? And we take the record home and we listen to it and cried all day. <laughs> B.B. Buell was working as a model in New York when she first started dating rock stars. I was an attractive, successful young lady and considered H.O.T. You know, it's as simple as that. And the boys compare notes and the pop stars talk amongst themselves and, and you know, they... they they, uh, the word gets around. I had a five-year relationship with Ty Rundgren, and um, it 
was not always a monogamous relationship. It was not always a perfect relationship, but it was a five-year relationship, and I lived with him. We shared a home together. And um, at the end of our relationship, I um, began an affair with my daughter's father. And I had made a concrete decision at this point that I was actually going to be with Steven Tyler. But I just could not take it. It was like a trip to Peru every day. Too much cocaine. And I couldn't do any drugs because I was pregnant. And um, Todd represented sanity to me. So yes, we went back together. And yes, Liv was born as Todd's child. And uh, of course, you know, it was not going to work. And right in the middle of all of this was, you know, my moment, as I call it, with Rod Stewart, because he was an old friend. He was somebody I had just met socially through, through Ron Wood and Mick Jagger. He was not anybody I ever fancied or wanted to date. He was not my cup of tea. I found him um, very fun, you know, but I just, you know, he just, I like, uh, I like my men a little bit more deep. But maybe that was what was fun about him, and maybe that's what I needed at that moment, was a bit of an escape. It was a relationship I thought that would be fun and stress-free that turned out to be the biggest nightmare of my life. Because I was living at the Portobello Hotel modeling, and I was going out and seeing Adam and the Ants and the Sex Pistols and the Clash, and I was living my life. Rod Stewart was not part of my consciousness, and being associated with him every five minutes was like having a boil. You know, it was awful. But the thing I loved about Elvis is that he didn't care. And he was willing to go up against that. And I also had to take the backlash of the fact that he had, was married, even though he was legally separated. That's another thing that people don't realize. When I met him, he was legally separated. I am a rock and roll girl, and I might as well just face it. Just this <laughs> you know, there's just no, I'm not going to get out of this. I go to Egypt. I think I'm in Egypt. I'm in Egypt. No rock and roll, right? I go by on my camel. Guess who comes by on the other camel? Jerry Garcia. I go, this only happens to me. I've given up. You know, it's like... <laughs> Drugs and then the women are, are next online, you know, and it's part of that macho, you know, this is what you do and I'm a rock star. And when there's women falling at your feet, ringing your room and, you know, hanging outside the door, it's too available. But, um, I don't stand for any of that. Beat the shit out of anyone that comes near my husband. Question three. That's the Christian names of two of the Pointer Sisters. Some wives are happy to fall by the wayside. And for these two friends, a night at the pub holds more appeal than their former rock and roll lifestyle. It was one of those months, May, oh no, um, April, no, hang on. Question number five. Which group had a hit with Call for Cats in 1979? Was it? Was it Riley? Was it Squeeze? Oh shit, it's Squeeze. Oh, damn. Probably Paisley. stupid the assumption the songwriter husband was in touch with his feelings because he was writing and I think I, you make that assumption about a lot of people that write songs is that because they've written these fantastic words that touch your heart that they must be very together and sorted out but in fact the whole process of trying to sort themselves out is what creates the songs Cindy married Chris Difford in the early days of Squeeze. Jane married his co-vocalist Glenn Tilbrook eight years later. The year that Glenn and I actually had our marriage ceremony, he was in the studio from January to the day before our wedding. And then he was off in America promoting in August, and then he was off on tour from September um, right through to Christmas. And then we split up. Which brings us, I suppose, to um, make-up women. <laughs> the 
of course, both husbands did um, eventually bugger off with them. Yeah. <laughs> yes, contrary to popular myth, um, it's not the groupies and the fans that um, end up. Well, I mean, let's face it; they're all going to do it. Or they they are. I used to think not my bloke, but um, it's usually somebody in the camp. I think men, if they have women throwing them throwing themselves at them all the time, it must be very difficult to ignore and refuse their offers, you know. I think it's an extension of the applause myself. I think it's sort of like they're being told, well, this is great, this is great, you're wonderful, you're fantastic, a great song, you know, whatever, from the record company people to the audience. And then going back to a hotel room yes, on your own with a telly, and yeah. it's all sort of anonymous and yes. things. And empty, it's just empty. But if you've got somebody there saying, oh, you're really nice, it's <laughs> it sort of just goes on from, yeah. carries on, you know. And you always knew something was going on because everybody would be terribly polite and officious to you and sweet and sympathetic and the pitying looks would always give it away, always. And it's not like real life because in real life when that sort of thing goes on there's always going to be somebody or another that goes, you are acting like a fool or you're behaving badly. But in this sort of lifestyle nobody says anything and it's all condoned. But they forget that the other partner is usually from real life, and it does hurt, and it's really painful. Yeah. For a lot of musicians, pain can be useful. Creativity is to do with the darker side, the shadow side, the side that you don't see the side that you don't show, the side that you perhaps don't even know until you start doing it, until you start painting or writing or acting or, or composing. You don't know you have that darker side. And that's the one that sends people very, very far into areas that sometimes, you know, they get out of control in. Because you have to be out of control to a certain extent to be able to actually really create. We gotta get out of this We lived in a very small flat, which was very dark, and there were always a lot of people around, hanging out, you know, watching horror films, and they watched an awful lot of horror films and violent films. He was always attracted to real sleazebags, basically, and I think for him it made him feel good, because they were a lot less together than he was, which was saying quite a lot. I mean, that is, that's just a whole trip in itself, is like wanting to be as far out and live as close to the edge and be as, live as dangerously and push people and life and your body as far as you can and still get away with it and probably maybe not even get away with it and that's part of the thrill isn't it that you might not even get away with it but it was like living in a movie it's like living in like Pulp Fiction or something you know it's just you never knew what was going to happen next and things were never secure things were never certain and I suppose I liked that I liked the excitement of it did you ever think you had to save him? yeah that was the idea. It was a crusade. It was something that I could identify, it was something I could do to look after and protect and counsel somebody who was in so much agony and pain and misery. Um, and now that I mean now that I think about it, it's it's it was something that made it gave me an opportunity not to think about myself, not to think about any problems I had and not to actually look at my life and uh, what I was thinking or feeling or where that was going and just sort of completely take over his. The next morning I went down to the hotel to, to find him because we were going back to London. Knocked on the door and uh, there was no answer so I got the, um, the roommate to let me in. And this woman jumped out of the bed and scurried into the bathroom. <laughs> So I ran after her and I tried to get in and tried to beat her up, but she'd gotten in, she got, she was too quick, she got into the bathroom and she shut the door. So I just um, thought, sod this and left, you know, went back to London. I thought, right, great opportunity to leave forever, never go back. Um, so I'd gone her back in London maybe a day later. There was a phone call from Shane's sister, Siobhan, telling me that Shane had been committed to St. John of God's in Dublin and had been certified. Um, and I think what led up to that was an incident where he'd painted himself black 
and jumped out of a moving car onto the motorway. They told me that he had, you know, repented and was like trying to get back on the right track, but I knew this wasn't really likely. But I went anyway. And uh, he was all sort of sweet and clean and sober in the bed with his blue pyjamas on. <laughs> and so I forgave him. For any kind of creative artist, it's always useful to put yourself through extremes of emotion. Because if you're not going through extremes of emotion, um, you're not really going to connect with people. And I think that, you know, real passion in, in music and stuff always comes from extremes. Sobriety fucking sucks. Mm. when I fell in love with him but he went from a nice alcoholic to a bad alcoholic he he couldn't take the strain it, it really got to him and his behavior was out of control and it got from bad to worse you know you do all the naive things of you know if you don't stop drinking I'm gonna leave you and you know I'm gonna take the kids and it's you can't stop an alcoholic from drinking. There's nothing you can do. At the height of Bowie's success, Angie feared that he was a star in danger of burning out. I kept thinking, what is up with him? What is the matter with him? And it, you know, sort of through the grapevine, I would hear that, you know, he was just doing a lot of cocaine, a lot of this and a lot of that. And I was like, ooh, how gross. Because it just wasn't my my thing. I, mean, I didn't mind the shows. I didn't mind hanging out with the band. I didn't mind hanging out with the lighting and, you know, that's what I do. You know what I mean? Direct, do that kind of stuff. So that was fun. But hanging out with David was, um, the more he got involved in, in self-destructive behavior was, um, the only way that you could really ride it was do it yourself. <laughs> introduce you to my bass player Mikey. He's a great kid. Look, he, he drinks good beer. He was so out of control. He was he was at the point where he was making cocktails of pills and whatever he could get his hands on, mixing it, taking it, whatever he could shove into himself, he was shoving him. When our second daughter was born, he agreed to go to the Betty Ford Center. And um he loved it. He had six weeks of fun. He loved every minute of it. He was friends with Betty Ford. Liz Taylor was coming in and giving speeches. I mean, there was, it was just, it was like a holiday camp for celebs. He breezed through it the whole six weeks and, you know, this is it. I'm never going to drink again. He came out at 12 noon at 2 o'clock. He was drunk as a skunk on the floor throwing up. And then it, it, it kind of went like that. Ozzy you know, went to seven clinics. Seven different clinics. And he did, <laughs> he woke up one evening and decided he wanted to kill me. And um, we had a little domestic tiff when I had Ozzy taken away. He was arrested. And um, the court put him into another treatment center. And he realized how low he'd got. They were, he couldn't get any lower. And it was out of bad comes good. And he's been sober ever since. Sixteen years on from her life with David Bowie, Angie is still trading in her rock and roll memories. And to my right would be the one and only Angela Bowie. You may have read her book, Backstage Passes. 
I read about half of it. And that was a great tell-all book. I, except, you know, I never really thought about it as tell-all. I, I hope it was entertaining. I mean, as far as it being tell-all, it was an eyewitness account. Yeah. And what, what would be the most famous story in that book? Uh, if, are you referring to Mick Jagger and David? Yes, I uh, am. Probably. I would think that would, would be the most. I think that there are far, lots of stories in that book that I remember with a lot more enthusiasm and affection. But if, if we're talking about, particularly in the context of this show, yeah, that would be the most famous. All right, so let's, do a, let's do a quick and, and I hope, hopefully a, not a painful reenactment of what happened there. Mick and David have gone off to a room together. No. I came back from a trip from Europe. Right. I arrived with my suitcases. I went upstairs. As I was going upstairs, my assistant said, David and Mick crashed last night. Don't be surprised. I said, okay, fine. So I opened the door and I said, what do you want for breakfast? And went downstairs and made breakfast. Oh, come on. They, they were unconscious. Comatose. Tired from sex. Tired from sex? I don't think so. Drunk, I would say. All right. Yeah. So you're... You don't think anything went on between the two? Oh, I didn't say that. Oh, okay. That's oh, wait better. a minute. Well, right, I never said better. that. All right, but that's what we want. That's the kind no, of show we're doing here. here. You, I mean, you were just knee deep in that whole scene. Yes. I mean, you guys got together before David Bowie was really David Bowie. I mean, yes. in the sense that that people know him now. Yes. And then what what went wrong? I I, I know nothing about True. your history. Hold on. That's, I, we're I mean, not there yet. Slow down. Well, I just slow okay. down. They you, got they got together right. and and you had an open marriage. Yes. Which meant that's what went wrong. That is that how you conduct a marriage now? You think? Do you think that's a, a healthy way to conduct one? I think marriage is unhealthy. In general, therefore, the entire question is irrelevant to me. For you, for yes. you. But in general, if a marriage, if somebody's going to try to make a marriage, I told David that I would never divorce him. If he wanted a divorce, he would have to divorce me because at one stage before we got married, he said, "You'll never leave me," and I said, "No, I won't. I'll never leave you." Well, that's all very well, dear, and it sounds just fabulous, and everyone says, "Oh." Shit. Fine woman, good Catholic woman, colonel for a father, moral, righteous. Except you try to get a lawyer to defend your rights in a divorce when you've refused to get the divorce, refused, therefore, to file for whatever those things are that you're supposed to file for, you know, brain mismanagement, maltreatment, whatever. And I didn't want custody of Zoe because I knew that the only way David would stay alive was if he had Zoe. And was it difficult to say goodbye to your child? Well, I didn't say goodbye to him. I went to Switzerland to meet them for the holidays, and they'd all left and gone to Berlin. Oh, I see you were really excited about me coming for Christmas. Okay. So, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't even a question of saying goodbye. It was a question of, like, picking myself up off the floor, which I did not do. I fell down the stairs. I, I got so high and so pissed off and so infuriated I took all these Equinol these muscle relaxers and I was like staggering around the house like thinking I was gonna die my nervous breakdowns are major and very short-lived you know they usually take a day a day when it, if I can't speak on the phone I'm having a nervous breakdown and, it, and, and I'm fortunate perhaps to have that because then it, it means one doesn't get seriously depressed like poor people who start to feel embittered or start to feel that their whole life is, you know, not worth living because they've been disappointed by something or somebody. And I never really felt like that. I was disappointed in myself for being a jackass. When Rolling Stone Charlie is away, Shirley doesn't live in an empty house. This is enough to give one a heart attack, you know. She shares her home with 27 dogs, most of them rescued from dog pounds around the country. It's not an easy thing. Eyes everywhere, even under the table. Remember when I first came, I had about four dogs' heads in my lap. It was quite um, disconcerting. But, but they're really very good, I think. You know? yeah, it's, uh, it's no place for people who don't like animals. They don't come here. Mm. Obviously, you did just on a big tour. How did you cope with coming back home again? Probably? It's very difficult. Very difficult. Because the very place that he's been longing to be, he finds it very unsettling. And once he's unpacked his suitcases and his travelling trunks, um, He's not quite sure what to do. 
And then he's, once he's become used to being amongst his own, his own belongings and in his own home, he's bored. He's bored because he's a musician and that's all he does and that's all he wants to do. So he has to go away again. It, it works pretty well. I mean, there's, there's nothing worse than seeing somebody, you know, moving around, not knowing what to do with themselves. When Ozzy's home, we're very, very quiet. He's, he loves to stay at home because he's not here, so he, he doesn't leave. He literally doesn't leave the property, he's here. How often do you see him? Um, probably, if you work it out, it's probably ten days of every month. And you bring the kids? No, only on school breaks. I bring the kids. But you talk on the phone, obviously. Oh, yeah, like, you know, 20 times a day. You know, 20. Oh, where's my socks? Or what shirt should I wear with these trousers? What are the dogs doing today? And how are the dogs? And, you know. Tuesday, 5.20 p.m. Hi, it's Hayden Donovan from MCP. Sean, hey, it's Bob. I'm saying it's, uh... Three LA time AM, and I'm up doing paperwork. I... What we need you to do is draft us a letter, which I have to get these contest winners to sign. Which is worth more? You've got to get Michael to check both sound scans. He'll do nothing before the show. He'll do nothing before Thursday. Okay, thanks, Rob. Bye. A friend of mine once said to me that when you're old and you're on your deathbed, there's been nobody that's ever said they wish they'd spent more time in the office. And it's true. I don't know how people that have like, you know, three, four, five hit acts can do it. I mean, the, the work pressure is amazing just for one, let alone any more. And I wouldn't be willing to give up more of my life to do it. Especially for people that you don't love. It's different when you love the person that you're doing it for. But to do it for people that you don't love, it's like... See ya. Recently, Shirley has emerged as one of the country's top breeders of Arab horses. She now has 90 of them in her stud because she can rarely bring herself to sell them. expensive shampoo in the world. It's very liquid, liquid yes. <laughs> he knows it should be a chamomile shampoo. But he used this horse who usually has peach blossom condition, doesn't he? Oh, he's going to have his peach uh, condition. Yeah. He wouldn't leave the place without being conditioned properly. Peach blossom <laughs> The girls would not have anything to do with yeah. him. <laughs> so really, life is as you might have dreamed as a, ch as a child? Oh, yes. Yes, and I, I read, I read and read about people who had horses and dogs and lived in the country. And it's a million times better than I ever thought it would be. Because of the horses and the dogs. Isn't it going to be huge? Yes, he is. He's... But I don't think he's losing anything in, uh, in beauty and refinement. Oh, no. He? No, I don't either. Try me to stand her up, shall we? Yes, we can see how beautiful she is. Do you have to dream to last this long? No. No, because when I was complaining to Charlie's mother once about his absences, uh, I think it was just before we got married, she said, oh, she said, don't, don't worry about it, it will be over in a year. Do you go and see them? Who? Do you go the Stones? Them? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they're one of my favourite bands. I, I still love their music. That must be a very different life. You'd go, you'd go out to town and go to a gig. How are you treated? Are you by the organisation? Oh, it's Lady Watts. As I should be. 
I'm a dowager almost, aren't I? What do you think you've got out of this life? Oh, a wealth of experience that, you know, sometimes you think, God, if only I could have changed that, I could change this. There are some things I would want to change in my life, but basically I'm happy with the path that it took because I've got such experiences that, that are just so many, it amazes me sometimes. And also it gave me a strength, a huge strength. Do you still think he's desirable? Love him to death, he's sexy and gorgeous. <laughs> he's handsome. And he looks better though he's off the booze, doesn't he? Oh, much better, and he's much better without that bloody blonde hair too. <laughs> the glitter stage definitely didn't work for my old man. <laughs> Good life. It's it's a great life and it is and I and I've got to the stage now where I think Jesus I'm tired, I'm tired of fighting. Do I want to be doing this when I'm 55? No way. Uh uh, no way. There's not too many other things in life I want to do. In order to get on with her own life, Victoria needed to put some distance between herself and Shane. Things improved a lot after I got my own place. <laughs> because I could stand back from the relationship a lot and see it as it actually was and see it as a person who I really liked and loved and not as a nuisance and I was able to go back and not try to make Shane give up what he was doing purely for my happiness because really what I'd been trying to do was make him give it all up so that things would be safe and secure and I wouldn't have to worry about it I realised that I was more scared of myself and being alone than I was of any amount of hassle or, you know, um, catastrophes or nightmare situations involving shame. Having moved to Paris when she married Jean-Michel Jarre, Charlotte Rampling now finds his career takes him away from her for long periods. I was so bonded to Jean-Michel and I, I so love him and so still do that I had to just find ways that that made sense of my life not without him but with a with a big absence of him and I think all I think this is a probably very necessary path that you know women all go through at some stages for different reasons it's like it's the coming to terms of with yourself and sort of saying all right it's me and me really isn't it Victoria has turned to a medium to channel voices from the spirit world. She believes these will help her in her voyage of self-discovery. You cannot separate spiritual awareness, spirituality, from that which happens to you in an everyday mode. Mm. The dustman clearing the rubbish away may not enjoy his life, may not enjoy his job, but he is doing something which is useful on a spiritual level, how are you not to know that he is not clearing away the psychic garbage from you as well? Mm. I made the decision about a year ago that everything else in life all would all slot into place and would all just fit and be exactly the way I wanted it if I became enlightened. And that's what my book's about. It's a, like a diary of me trying to become enlightened against like the background of living with people who drink a lot and take loads of drugs and stay up all night watching horror films, you know, <laughs> short of actually, you know, shaving my head and, and joining a, joining the Harry Krishnas. I've done most of the things that, that people do and, and I'm still doing them, you know, it's an ongoing thing. I haven't actually become enlightened yet. Now I'd like you to imagine that there's a white light coming in through the top of your head and filling your whole body. So breathe in, breathe in deep. And as the white light comes in, it'll go all the way through you. Okay? Right. This opens up your psychic powers and intuitive powers.
But when the dreams fail, reality has a cold look. What would have been a good settlement? Ten million dollars? Yeah, I suppose that might have been all right. Might have taken me a bit longer to spend it. No, I don't think he was not generous. He was just... He's a Yorkshireman. You know, he didn't want to sign the deal with the EMI while I was still in tow and, and would be available to, to share and take 50% of it. It was a marriage of convenience. And it was a marriage where it gave him a lot more strength to say he was bisexual and to say that he had had gay encounters and then be able to renege on it totally and say, oh, it was just, it was just promotion, it was just propaganda, I was just saying that. He tires me out. I can't stand hypocrites, they really drive me nuts. What was the point of like, you know, coming clean and saying it and really giving so many kids who are having identity crises some understanding that it was okay and then because you get to be middle-aged and scared and you want to hang out with royalty you suddenly say oh it was a lie I never meant any of it I don't know about you but it doesn't sit well with me worst thing you can do is become a middle-aged bore self-satisfied too prosperous and not able to stand up and say I'm not scared of losing everything because I think what you're talking about is a load of shite <laughs> Some rock and roll girls never give up. After a long and exhaustive search, and at the age of 42, BB Buell finally became a fully certified bona fide rock wife. It was immediate. As soon as I saw my husband, as soon as I laid my eyes on him, I turned to live. And that was also beautiful that I was with my, my daughter, my best friend at the moment. And I said, there's the man I'm going to marry. I just knew. Amazing. I've never been married. He's like an angel, sort of. He sort of just sort of came flying down out of nowhere. Little black wings and pointy boots. <laughs> he's thin, but he's tall and broad-shouldered and healthy. Good, you know, a good upper body. For Betty Davis stars as an aging Broadway actress in an Academy Award winning story of ruthless ambition all about Eve. Yeah, baby, baby. Really sucks, baby. 